All right. Um, I think uh, the time is right now and we can start a meeting. Um, before all, I would like to say a uh, warm welcome to all of our participants in this evening. Um, my name is Mihai Moreanu. I'm the, currently the president of Walter Dendi Neurosurgical Society. And uh, this night, I'll be also the moderator of this meeting. Uh, as you may already know, we are um, looking for uh, getting more and more knowledge about uh, vascular neurosurgery. And that's why in this uh, evening, we are having two presentations uh, about vascular neurosurgery, specifically about cavernomas and uh, surgical approaches of cavernomas. With us today, it's uh, our scientific coordinator, Max, who is going to present uh, a short uh, lecture um, about cavernomas. Um, and after this, we are going to have a special guest coming directly from uh, Uzbekistan, Dr. Dirshad, uh, who is currently working in a vascular department of neurosurgery and who's going to present uh, an interesting case and some surgical aspects regarding uh, how uh, to approach uh, such pathology. Um, I wish you have a really um, nice evening and I hope everything you will uh, uh, explore this evening will help you in your future career. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask uh, the doctors or Max. And um, uh, if you don't want to disturb, you can just let the questions in the chat. Thank you, and um, I wish you good luck to everyone, and uh, let's have a really nice uh, meeting. Thank you. Max, you have the mic. Thank you, Mihai. I'm going to share my presentation now. So, yeah, so today's evening will be uh, mostly about uh, cavernous malformations, and I'm going to give you a general or a broad introduction about this topic. Um, so first of all, I want to um, have you keep this picture in mind um, as we go on, because the slides will have a lot of text and you should never forget what it's about. So it's about a, this um, violet thing right there, which is a cavernous malformation. So first, the nomenclature, we call it uh, cavmal, cavernoma, cavernous angioma and all these names here. But in this presentation, I will refer to it as a CCM, so a cerebral cavernous malformation. And um, there is a new nomenclature and it's officially termed slow flow venous malformation now, um, but it's still helpful to use the, vo the word cavernous uh, because most clinicians just know it by this name. Um, so about definition, it's a rare, benign, and well-circumscribed vascular anomaly. It occurs in many parts of the body, but obviously it's uh, most dangerous in the brain and the spinal cord. And so what is it actually? It's a cluster of abnormal tiny blood vessels and larger stretched out thin walled blood vessels. And as I said, in the brain, it's called cerebral um, cavernous malformation, so CCM. Um, it's a tangle of capillaries and it's prone to leaking. So that's the main pathology right here. It's the hemorrhage. And it can create these small caverns of blood within the brain, which is obviously toxic, uh, toxic for the brain parenchyma. So here you can see a typical appearance of a CCM. Um, you see the dilated sinoids. Uh, it has, it's in various stages found. So it can have bleeding or thrombosis or different organizations. And what is important to know is there's no prominent feeding or draining vessel and there are no, there's no intervening neural tissue. So that's what distinguishes the CCM from other um, pathologies like venous anomalies or capillary telangiectasis and mostly from AVM. So you know that AVMs have um, these prominent feeding or draining vessels and also intervening neural tissue, but CCM does not have these things. So the etiology is not fully understood, um, but we know that most are sporadic. So the patient has no family history and typically presents with only one CCM. 
or it can be familiar, so inherited, um, autosomal dominant inheritance. So it's either genetic in 80% of the cases, the patient has a family history and he has multiple, so more than one CCM. Um, so here are the genes that are mutated, the CCM1, CCM2, and CCM3. Uh, and here are the respective uh, chromosomes parts where they are mutated. Um, so the CCM protein products that are uh, made by these genes, they interact with each other and with other cellular machinery. And these products are responsible for functions like cell-to-cell -cell communication and angiogenesis. And here, these are the two etiologies. So for sporadic, first of all, we have a common pathway that involves uh, de novo mutations. But in familiar, we have a so-called two-hit hypothesis, which was proposed and it states um, these things. So first, the first hit would be an epigenetic exposure and the second hit is the environmental exposure. And this leads to this CCM gene loss of function. Um, and that's also why uh, these lesions um, accumulate over time or tend to accumulate over time and with exposure to radiation. Uh, so that's also important to keep in mind. Radiation is not very good for uh, these genes. They cause this pathology. So something about epidemiology. The incidence is, you can see these two numbers. So these were two different numbers, but um, all it shows is that it's pretty rare in the general population, but still it's the most common or one of the most common cerebral vascular abnormalities. Um, as you can see, up to 25% or more conservatively up to 13% um, of all vascular malformations. And even though it's rare, it's the second most common incidental uh, vascular finding after aneurysms. Um, and you find it on the MRI. And since there are more MRIs done nowadays, you will also incidentally find more CCMs. And that's just the prevalence of so one in 652 or 25, I don't know. In German, it's the other way around. Uh, neurological asymptomatic people have this. So um, it doesn't discriminate. So it's equally in women and men. Um, however, the, the prognosis might be different um, in women and men. And the clinical presentation is bimodal. So this means that you can find it in both adolescents and middle-aged adults. So it peaks in these two um, cases. And in middle-aged adults, it's mostly 40-year-old uh, patients that um, present with this symptomatic CCM. Uh, so the majority of CCMs will be found supratentorially. We will see this later also. Um, yeah, and that's just due to the bigger volume. So obviously supratentorial, there's more um, brain volume. So it's more likely that it will appear there. Um, so most patients will have a single lesion, but as we said, for the familiar one, they might have multiple ones. Um, and for these, the screening of family members might be indicated. Um, CCMs are commonly seen following cerebral, yeah, exactly. So as I said, rad radiotherapy is uh, not that good for CCM. So it induces these gene mutations and forms this pathology. Also interesting is that Hispanic American populations um, or persons of Northern Mexican ancestry, they have a higher proportion of familiar cases, um, rates as high as 50%. So that's uh, good to know. And that's due, be, due to this common founder mutation that uh, took place probably some decades ago. Um, so about the pathophysiology, CCM may arise de novo, as we said. It may grow, it may shrink or remain stable over time. And the size, it can be very small, so under one millimeter or up to even several centimeters. Um, and about location, we said that 80% so most are found in the supratentorial space, um, as you can see in this image here, very nice. Then 15% are in the posterior fossa, 
which you could see here. So here's one in the brainstem and 5% are in the spinal cord. So it's pretty rare in the spinal cord. Um, more about pathophysiology. So they're usually made up of low flow um, blood vessels. So that's why the nomenclature was also changed to this low flow. Um, so this causes this sludge, sluggish uh, blood flow. And this further ca causes recurrent thrombosis, calcification, deposition of hemorrhoziderin. Um, and if it doesn't rupture and the patient doesn't uh, have symptoms, he might never present and the CCM will sit dormant for a long time. Um, so yeah, as we said, he can be asymptomatic throughout his life if it's dormant. This uh, happens in up to half of the patients and it will be found incidentally on MRI. Or as we said, he can be symptomatic and mostly he presents or she, like the patient presents due to seizures. Um, this is in 40% of cases or they uh, might present because of hemorrhages. So this is an up to 6% of cases. Um, so these hemorrhages, as I said, these are the main uh, pathology in this uh, disease or in this malformation. So if they leak into adjacent brain parenchyma, that's obviously not good and it's toxic, so it can cause seizures. And if you have a patient that presents with seizures, you can think that it's probably in the supratentorial lesions, while if he presents with focal neurologic deficits or ataxia, it's probably in the infratentorial region, so in the cerebellum or brainstem. Um, and he can also present with a headache. And obviously these symptoms depend on localization, size um, and strength of the walls. Um, but these symptoms tend to resolve as the hemorrhage is absorbed. Um, so here is a nice picture. That's a more very like cluster. So that's how it kind of looks. Um, so you will have these abnormally dilated, hyalinized, thin-walled capillaries. So now we go into histopathology a little bit, which I know all of us love. Um, yeah, so these multi-lobed, you can see. And um, there's a single layer of epithelium. And well, it's surrounded by gliosis and hemosiderin deposits, which were caused by these uh, micro hemorrhages and thrombosis that occurs in, in this malformation. And as we said on histopathology, unlike in AVMs, you cannot see any normal brain between these, uh, between in this lesion. And like microscopy shows that there is an, there are no uh, smooth muscle wall layer and there are abnormalities in the endothelial gap junction. So, the lesions may gradually enlarge due to small hemorrhages, uh, progressive hy hyalinization, thickening of the ves vascular wall, gradual thrombosis. Um, and also the CCMs, they may be associated with uh, developmental venous anomalies. Uh, that's also interesting for later for the treatment because you should not excise them. Um, and if it's associated with one of these DVAs, so developmental venous anomalies, then it's called a mixed vascular malformation. So here I'm not going <laughs> to bore you with this, but you can see theoretically, if you have an eye for it, the thin walls, uh, single layers, the uh, some fibrosis and luminal thrombosis, and especially the hemorrhoziderin and the hemato toidine deposit. So the hemosiderin is also important for later for the treatment of um, seizure, seizures. So you have to excise everything. So um, about history and the physical, physical what? Okay, I didn't write it. So for newly diagnosed cavernomas, what do we do? Uh, first, we do a throughout history for evidence of prior symptomatic hemorrhages. Then we check for prior neurologic events if he had some or not. Then if he takes any antithrombotic medications, we do a comprehensive neurological exam. And now if he presents with a headache, it's a challenge to know if it's actually caused by CCM or if it's just by something else. And uh, the same with epilepsy. 
because sometimes the CCM might be very small within the brain. You might not find it as a seizure focus, and then you don't know if it's related to epilepsy. Um, so that's why you can categorize it as definite, probable, or unrelated to uh, CCM if you find, if you have a patient that presents with epilepsy. Um, so you should do three generation family history if you have a patient with a familial CCM. And you should consider genetic screening if this patient presents uh, with multiple CCM, if he had a family history and so on. And uh, you might also give counseling um, regarding the fami familiar risk. Also have a risk benefit discussion regarding the testing asymptomatic relatives. Um, now about imaging. So we have a CT. In CT, it's pretty difficult to see CCMs. Um, because CT lacks sensitivity and specificity for them. And uh, so only if they are large, you can see like a region of hyperdensity and these blood, blood products are specks of calcification, but it's uh, pretty hard to see it. And also if there was a recent bleed, then it's more easy to see. You have to look for these uh, mantle of edema and so on and uh, usually if you do a non-contrast head ct you will only identify hemorrhage in a symptomatic patient so you still don't know if it's ccm okay so that's why you do mri that's the gold standard um, you do it with or without contrast and gradient echo sequences so this has a hundred percent specificity uh, apparently and uh, if you have this parenchymal hemorrhage and you don't know what it is, then you do this MRI and you can assess for the underlying vascular lesion, which in our case will probably be a CCM. And uh, also further in the treatment, you can repeat the, CC, uh, the MRI to visualize again the size, the any recent bleeding or new lesions. Um, and now for the angiogram, uh, that's also you, you should keep in mind that uh, you won't be able to see anything with an angiogram. Uh, that's due to the slow blood flow because we said uh, it's, a it's a slow flow of vascular malformation. And um, yeah, they're actually part of this thing called angiographically occult vascular malformation. So um, there are also other malformations as these CCMs that you won't see on angiogram. And again, they have no arterial venous shunting um on angiogram so then there are other so basically you need only the mri but there are also for planning and everything their diffusion tensor uh, sequences or functional mri um well as written it's for planning especially for brainstem or difficult uh for difficult locations and well, this visualizes the matter tracks in eloquent areas. And there are many more imaging uh, strategies. Here I have for you a Zabramski classification. So this is not really used uh, in clinical practice, but it's useful in scientific publications. So if you want to study CCMs and to kind of differentiate the uh, CCMs from one another. So it has, uh, well, first type one, it has four types. So type one is usually the subacute hemorrhage. Um, okay, so the T1, you will see hyper intense and on T2 weighted MRI, you will see hyper or hyper, hyper intense as seen in the picture to the right. So T1 and T2, that's type one subacute hemorrhage. Uh, then we have the type two which is actually the most common type. And it's also called cl a classical popcorn lesion. It uh, apparently looks like a popcorn. So on T1, T2, you have uh, this mixed signal intensity and you even have sometimes a low signal rim with blooming. Um, then type three, it's chronic hemorrhage on T1, T2. So hypo-intense to iso-intense centrally. Um, 
and also this low rim with blooming. And then you have type four, um, which are multiple punctuate hemorrhages. So this one, <laughs> I see the best one on the um, MRI because it's it has these wait these black dots um, with blooming, as you can see on the right side of the right picture. Um, but they are actually difficult to distinguish from small capillary telangiectasia. So you don't even know if this is CCM for sure. Um, so type one and type two, as we said, they were hyper intense mostly. And this, um, and that shows, uh, most shows up mostly in symptomatic, uh, patients. Um, and they have an increased risk of hemorrhage or rehemorrhages. And that's why for these types, we should consider a more aggressive surgical management. Um, for most symptomatic lesions. So this now is not for these uh, classifications. So this is just in general for the most symptomatic lesions. They um, present with an evidence of recent hemorrhage and surrounding edema. And this also correlates with the risk of further hemorrhage. Um, the MRI is, well, yeah, it's, uh, you can see multiple lesions, so then you know it might be uh, familial. But as we see later in differential diagnosis, it could also be a metastasis or something. So now about the treatment and manages, um, management. We have three options, conservative, uh, surgical, or stereotactic, uh, radiosurgical. So first, the conservative management. Um, we just do serial imaging and we observe. And there was a guideline in 2017 by the Angioma Alliance that states that we should treat conservatively all these patients that do not have symptoms, so that present asymptomatically, that have small and incidentally discovered lesions. And then for microsurgical resection, so where do we do surgery? Um, we have to think where we do surgery because the risk of this intervention um, has to be weighted carefully with the risk of having an untreated CCM. So maybe you don't want to um, undergo surgery, so there will be no risk from the surgery, and you're okay with the risk that the CCM might pose later on. So. Uh, maybe the it might not rupture and you say, okay, I don't want to have surgery. So it has to be decided uh, individually and case by case basis. And um, as we said, the CCM is highly variable and location dependent. So each patient has to have their own treatment strategy. And okay, now more about surgery. So it's the only definite treatment. Um, and the goal is obviously complete lesionectomy to prevent recurrent hemorrhages. For large lesions, we would do piecemeal excision. And for sm smaller ones, we do end block resection. Um, and that's where I said before, if you remember, so we try to spare these uh, CCMs that uh, or we try to spare the developmental venous anomalies that are associated with CCM sometimes uh, because they typically drain the surrounding normal brain. And if we would also resect them, we would potentially cause venous infarction. So that's not good. Um, further about surgery, we have, um, so when do we do it now? We do it for patients that have symptoms. Um, and we do it if the CCM is easily accessible. So not in a high risk location, it should be in a low risk location um, with non eloquent regions around it. So low risk. Yeah. So just quick before uh, surgery, we can give uh, one to two weeks before we can give steroids that reduce edema and aid with resection. And after we can do an MRI, um, within 20, uh, 72 hours to ensure the complete resection. Um, so as we said, deeply located CCMs are a great challenge, especially in brain stems, which we will see later the case presentation on. Um, and usually you do in brain stems only if um, 
there was a second symptomatic bleed. So first you don't try to do it surgically, but if there was a second symptomatic bleed, you try to do it. And especially in young patients with long life expectancy, you should consider surgery. But you have to know the complication rates are very high in these uh, deeply situated high risk um, regions. And uh, so complications are here. So 35% of cases. So almost half of them are expected to have a post operative neurologic deficit. Um, now about epilepsy, because we said the hemorrhage can cause um, epilepsy. So the hemorrhage irritates the brain parenchyma and so on, and it can cause epilepsy. So we do it and we should do it early. And only if the epilepsy cannot be treated otherwise by medicine, uh, by medical treatment, um, or if we know for sure that the CCM is the main cause of the epilepsy. And if the CCM again is in a low risk, easy accessible brain area. And also when we do it, we should uh, be careful that we reject all the um, hemosiderin stained gliotic brain that's surrounding the lesion. And um, yeah, this will lead to better seizure outcome if we reject all of it. So now the last one is stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, or not the last one, but the last of the three main ones. <laughs> um, so we do this in selected cases. So if the patients have symptoms, if they're symptomatic, and if the uh, lesion is inaccessible otherwise, so you can't do with surgery, so then you think of stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, and also it's done in people who have an unfavorable risk profile. Um, why? Because it's highly accurate, so that's good. It allows uh, this targeted delivery of the radiation but the negative aspects are that um so first off that's a controversy because the benefits from this radius uh, surgery might appear only two to three years after so after you go to the hospital you get this treatment there might still not be not be benefits um only two to three years after and this is uh, interesting because it concurs with this period of temporal hemorrhage clustering and I will talk to you uh, shortly about this after. So the they might, and as we said, this radio surgery or radiation is not good because it might even cause de novo CCMs. Um, and it's definitely not recommended for brainstem uh, CCMs. So then there are two others that I wanna talk about. It's this MRI guided laser interstitial thermal therapy, <laughs> what a name, so lit. And uh, it's pretty early results. Uh, they show that it's promising, but uh, more research is being done and so on. Um, and we can even treat it me with medicine, like with um, medication, but uh, that's limited because uh, obviously it's a surgical disease, the CCM. Um, but there were some, there was some research done in preclinical animal models, um, and it showed that statins and targeted um, RHO, I think, Ro, I don't know, kinase inhibitors, um, they reduce the symptoms and lesion progression. Um, so, but we still should follow these uh, guidelines and protocols that exist uh, when we treat uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage that are caused by CCM. So I'm not going into this deep now, and that's not important. Okay, um, so differential diagnosis are all these. I'm not going to go through all of them, but for example, the last one, you can see hemorrhagic metastasis. Um, this one was, as you saw in type four, so you can or type three, I don't remember. Okay, but you can, you're not sure if it's metastasis or if it's the other one with the dark spots. Um, for if they are large, again, metastasis, but uh, also other primary brain tumors, you could um, confound them. And if they're calcified, here are other differential diagnoses. And there are many more. Um, now about the outcome and prognosis, we're almost uh, finished. 
So first I will focus on the outcome and prognosis for hemorrhage itself. And later I will go into re-hemorrhage. So for hemorrhage, the rate for incidentally detected CCMs, as you can see, is pretty low. So that's why patients who present with an incidental TCM, they might not need any surgery, any treatment, uh, because it's so low, the rate of hemorrhage. But as you see here, if it's a symptomatic CCM, and if it's left untreated, then it's already 2.4% per year. And five years after the diagnosis, it's 15% uh, almost within these five years. So you should consider to get uh, treatment. So in patients without a history, they have only, again, this low rate per year of hemorrhage, but those that have a history, the rate rises to 4.5 almost. So for those who have this uh, familial, they should really consider to get treatment. Um, so to uh, summarize a bit, so you have an increased risk of hemorrhage if it's uh, infratentorial, the CCM, if it's uh, deep located, if you're young, if you're female, but uh, that's debated still. Um, and obviously if you have a symptomatic familiar case. And uh, right now, as I said, I'm just talking about CCMs, but for spinal and other CNS uh, CCMs, they're pretty similar, the hemorrhage rates. So now about uh, re-hemorrhage and we're almost done. So um, we don't know much about hemorrhage actually about the first symptomatic episode of hemorrhage caused by CCM. But the rehemorrhage, the risk factors for rehemorrhage is pretty well studied. Um, so I have some data for you also for this. Um, but first, it's, it should be noted that rehemorrhage is uh, really damaging. So it's, you will get more severe neurologic deficits and you have an increased risk of permanent deficit if you get a rehemorrhage. Um, so the rates will be 25% uh, per year during the first 28 months, which is uh, pretty high. And after 28 months, um, it's only 9.6, so it's less after this. But initially after a hemorrhage, you will get another one, uh, pretty sure. And yeah, now we have uh, two terms that I wanted to talk about in the end. So there is something called overt extra lesional hemorrhages. So they violate the lesions capsule and this leads to increased risk uh, for these recurrent hemorrhage. So if they violate this capsule. And there's this phenomenon that I talked before about. So temporal clustering. Um, uh, so this states that re-hemorrhage uh, tends to occur within two to three years after prior hemorrhage. And after this initial clustering of the hemorrhage um, events, there is a quiescent period. So there is no overt hemorrhages that occur um, after this temporal clustering. So there's two to three years and then it kind of just stops. So you don't get any more, or at least not many rehemorrhages. And that's what I said before, also with the um, stereotactic radio surgery. If you do this, the benefits come after two to three years. But the interesting thing is that it's shown that after two to three years, the rate of uh, hemorrhages occurring will go down anyways. So <laughs> then you don't even know if the benefit came from the stereotactic radiosurgery, or if it's just this phenomenon that's called temporal clustering or after temporal clustering. Anyway, so there are also other ones, um, other outcomes here for epilepsy rates, for example. Um, They're low for incidental lesions. Um, and the outcomes for uh, brain CCMs or for treating brain CCMs, it's obviously um, uh, dangerous and related with high um, risk. 
Okay, and yeah, so you should always try to reject the entire CCM because otherwise you, uh, with incomplete rejection, there might be hemorrhages after. And now about complications again. So as we said, uh, we have to do a case by case. Uh, we have to see if we want to do surgery or an intervention. <laughs> I added this slides like uh, five minutes ago, so I'm not even sure what it says. Um, well, we can skip this. Okay, so the overall mortality rate is low for the CCMs, which is interesting. So you don't have to get treatment necessarily if you don't think you want to have, um, but uh, progressive neurologic deficits might accumulate and they might reduce the patient's quality of life. So maybe you actually want to get uh, treatment. Um, so the post-operative morbidity is quite low and uh, that's if you're lucky and if you're in the hands of an experienced surgeon and if you're uh, selected appropriately. Um, but still, as we said before, you can also get uh, conservative management if this is your specific case. Um, a little bit about this. So you can give uh, anti-epileptic monotherapy. Uh, there are no guidelines for this, apparently. And uh, these seizure-free outcomes depend on the frequency of the post-operative seizures, depend on how much of the CCM you resected as a surgeon, and of how much of this perilesional hemosiderin ring you resected, and also when you uh, when the patient presented and when he was treated, so the timing, and the seizure recurrence is reduced by this uh, appropriate dose tapering when you withdraw the anti-epileptic drug after the treatment. So this was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And these were my references. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. A really nice, a really impressive presentation. Um, if there are any questions in the audience. About Max presentation, about Cabernomas. Max is our um, the scientific coordinator at Walter E. Dandy Neurosurgical Club Romania. He's also um, a student in our club. And we are really happy to have uh, him with us tonight. Uh, with us also tonight, we have uh, Dr. Dilshol Mamadaliev. Um, he's from Uzbekistan. He's a neurosurgeon uh, specialized and uh, he really loves vascular neurosurgery. Um, and uh, I'm really glad uh, to have with us tonight. He's gonna present uh, about brain and cavernomas, case reports, surgical approaches. Um, and I really uh, like to and say a warm hello to him. Um, and Dr. Dushal, you have the mic, you can uh, talk with us. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mihai Stelian and Dr. Max Lega. It was nice to see you all and having and getting to know you all. Uh, it's a nice, uh, family of neurosurgeons, I can say. Mm. And I would like to share some of our experience in this field, in brainstorm cover loma surgery. So we cannot boast about our huge experience, like in the US, like in the Japan or other uh, experienced countries from the vascular neurosurgery, but uh, we have done some of the interesting cases. Uh, before I uh, get into the details of the uh, brainstem cover numbers, I would like to a uh, little bit 
enlighten about the brain stem itself. So as we uh, we should uh, revise our knowledge and refresh uh, every day and before every surgery. So uh, brain stem itself. Uh, yeah. Brain stem itself consists of three parts, midbrain, bones, and medulla oblongata. And it facilitates communication between the cerebrum, cerebellum, and spinal cord. So this is a, a intermittent, uh, but very important organ. And it begins at the level of cerebral peduncle. Anteriorly and posteriorly, uh, the quadrigeminal plate or a tactile plate, and ends at the decussation of pyramids. So uh, there is a, a, a huge amount of uh, nuclei that are responsible for breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, consciousness, uh, different type of uh, reflexes, brainstem reflexes, taste, digestion, autonomic regulation and balance and coordination, and many others. And it houses uh, for the most of cranial nerves, mostly from this uh, third cranial nerve up to 12th cranial nerve. Uh, you can see uh, it is uh, almost uh, surrounded by uh, nuclei of cr cranial nerve and consists of many nuclei of cranial nerve. So uh, we can divide anatomically uh, brainstem into three parts, it's tectum, uh, stegmentum, you can see, and basal area. And every three uh, region of brainstem is itself uh, has got these uh, three layers. So tectum, tegmentum, and basal area. And what it uh, exactly consists uh, in it. A tectum uh, found it uh, organized by quadrigeminal plate, superior colliculi, inferior colliculi, cerebral aqueduct, superior aqueductal gray matter, and tegmentum uh, consists of red nucleus, reticular formation, substantia nigra, and cerebral, cerebral peduncles, corticospinal tract, spinothalamic tract, and other cranial nerves, uh, nuclei like th three and four. This is for midbrain. And many other structures uh, related to uh, pons and middle of Lambiat also. We're not going to uh, deep into details of these structures, but uh, only superficial revision. So uh, tectum, you can see here a four uh, colliculi, two pairs of superior and two pairs of uh, a pair of uh, inferior colliculi, which are responsible for audio uh, and visual reflexes. You can see a sagittal plane. And here you can appreciate a uh, axial image of superior colliculi, uh, basal part, pigmentum, and tectum. And also uh, midbrain, the basic and important uh, parts of the midbrain, it's a cerebral aqueduct, also called after uh, Francisco Silvius, uh, other name, aqueduct of Silvius. So uh, here you can appreciate this aqueduct, which is a pathway uh, between third ventricle and fourth ventricle. And also we can see a, a sagittal view of this aqueduct and uh, rostral view. There, uh, tegmentum, you can uh, say that tegmentum is a uh, region between cerebral aqueduct and cerebral peduncle. 
uh, consists of uh, red nucleus um, and uh, spinotonomic pathway. You can appreciate the borders. It's, it is located between tectum and basal area of the brainstem. Here you can see the red nucleus, which is uh, mostly for uh, motor coordination responsible. And also reticular formation, which is which mediates the level of consciousness. And whenever we uh, see patients in a comatose uh, state, we can uh, judge it by uh, if there is a lesion in the area of brainstem and, and the patient is after operation is comatose or um, in this state, so you can you can uh, judge it that uh, there is a uh, disturb disturption of the reticular formation. Here uh, at the base of the uh, uh, corticospinal tract uh, or before the corticospinal tract and uh, in between uh, tegmentum and basal area you can appreciate the substantia nigra uh, which is responsible for uh, cognitive planning emotions and war and basically uh, located dopaminergic neurons. And you all know that uh, when there is a, uh, any damage to these neurons, you can, uh, you can, you can see the uh, Parkinson's disease. Several pedancles, uh, you can uh, see here uh, in between, uh, it's a it's a pathway or uh, long tracks which are uh, connecting cerebral hemispheres with uh, brainstem. Uh, it's mostly consists of uh, corticospinal tracts, pyramidal tracts. And here you can see spinothalamic tracts, which relays uh, pain and temperature from contralateral side of body and thalamus. And also very important structure, uh, sort of bellal peduncles, which uh, which is a vital matter uh, tract connections between uh, brainstem and cerebellum, between uh, midbrain uh, and cerebellum, cerebellum nuclei, uh, which a, which is a superior cerebellar peduncle. Uh, connects midbrain with the cerebellum nuclei and pons with the cerebellum nuclei, it's a middle cerebe cerebellar peduncle. And the last one, uh, medulla with the cerebellum nuclei, it's an inferior cerebellar peduncle. This is uh, the basic uh, blood supply to the brainstem. Uh, you can see a basilar artery uh, and also pair of vertebral arteries, which, which can give a posterior inferior cerebellar arteries and uh, anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, and also a superior cerebellar artery, which supplies a superior half of the cerebellar hemispheres and these two uh, responsible for the lateral and posterior surface of the cerebellar hemispheres. Okay, this is a uh, nice uh, illustration from uh, Dr. Rolfen's uh, specimen. You can see the angiogram uh, and you can appreciate that uh, not every time a uh, basilar artery is uh, on the midline, it can uh, lateralize, it can be a different shape, and vertebral arteries are also can be in a 
uh, asymmetric form or one uh, ranging from different diameters from one another. You can see the uh, uh, the form of the vertebral uh, arteries. And uh, the way of uh, anterior inferior uh, cerebellar arteries. And uh, magnified view of basilar artery and perforating arteries, uh, which are going deep into the uh, brainstem, wide matter, uh, and pyramids and olives. You can see a ninth cranial nerve. And you can see a pica, vertebral artery, and ica, and perforating branches, which are basically uh, coming from basilar artery and also may uh, come from the vertebral arteries also. Uh, so as for cerebral cavernous malformations, uh, Dr. Max has uh, given us a very com comprehensive lecture. And I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat this information, but uh, this will be a, some kind of review also. So uh, it's a collection of small blood vessels capillaries and central nervous system that is enlarged and irregular in structure. So the walls of capillaries are thinner than normal, less elastic and are likely to leak. And cavernous malformations uh, can happen anywhere in the body. And they mostly uh, commonly produce symptoms when they are found in the brain and spinal cord. So uh, it's a cluster of blood vessels, can be uh, less than a quarter inch to four inch in size. And common symptoms include headache and seizures, but it depends on the uh, localization of the lesion. Uh, about one in 100 to 200 people have cavernous malformations. And the uh, malformations probably form before and shortly after birth. Some, some of them may seem to appear and disappear over time, follow up on my scans, uh, depends on the type of lesion. Uh, about 25% of people with cavernous malformation of the brain never have symptoms. So, okay, the complications of cavernous malformations, hemorrhage, uh, headache, seizures, and death. And these are the basic uh, tools of diagnostics, MRI, electroencephalogram, uh, CT scan, blood tests, gene testing, uh, and it's available in supplements. The benign vascular malformations comprising about 5 to 18% uh, of intracranial vascular malformations and generally present with focal neurological deficit. And the surgical treatment was first done by uh, Dr. Dandy in 1932, who resected the brainstem hematoma after cavernous and general leak. Between, two, between 10 to 23 percent are located in posterior fossa, with most in the pons. This is data from Dr. Kashiwagi. And if these lesions bleed, they can cause a severe neurological deficit or even death. And Correct management of these lesions is therefore very important. About diagnostic, we have uh, talked before, and intraoperative, very important to use uh, tools of neuro navigation and motor evoked potentials and brainstem evoked potentials. And treatment is basically surgery. Uh, there is a conservative treatment like anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, this is symptomatic therapy. And 
the important is uh, performing an MRI uh, regular intervals to keep an eye on the lesion. Uh, so what about prevention? Uh, but uh, it must be said that uh, currently it cannot be prevented. Uh, there is a theories and some uh, experiments uh, related to genes linked to this growth. Uh, like said Dr. Max in his lecture, uh, you can uh, examine two and three generations ago to, uh, uh, to find out whether there was a uh, in elder generation, this kind of lesion or not. Prenatal genetic testing and counseling are choices for the first person in a, a family with multiple cavernous malformation uh, or for relatives of those with identified familial cavernous malformations. So, uh, and here we have got a patient. Uh, this is a preoperative MRI. Of these patients on T1, T1 images, you can see a well uh, formed, well shaped lesion on the right sided uh, cerebellar pontine angle compressing uh, lateral uh, side of the pons. Uh, basically, it is pontine lesion. So we can say that uh, it is located in the lateral surface of the right side of the pons and extending to the cerebellar pontine system and covering all the trigeminal and seven and eight nerves roots. Here you can see uh, in T1 images also the uh, Hyper, hyper intense lesion, which has uh, a hemosiderin deposits in it. On the sagittal images, you can see a large brainstem uh, pontine cavernous malformation. Patient had symptoms of uh, adducent nerve palsy and uh, severe headache and cerebellar ataxia symptoms. And uh, before doing an operation, we have to be aware of uh, how to get into these kind of patients, uh, particularly in the brainstem area. And there is, uh, there are uh, many uh, safe entry zones, so-called safe entry zones, we can use it, use them in order to get into these lesions. So in our case, we have used this uh, fifth zone, the peritrigeminal zone, uh, in case when it, when the lesion is located, uh, for example, in perioculomotor motor zone, we can use this uh, uh, safe entry zone to uh, get into this lesion of, uh, lesion of the brainstem. But in our case, uh, it was uh, just uh, near the root of the trigeminal nerve and uh, expanding to the uh, cerebral pontine angle. So it, it was uh, easier to get from this uh, safe entry zone. And we have used also uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring, which included uh, some of the sensory adult potentials, uh, motor adult potentials, and brainstem adult potentials. So this is the procedure how we uh, this is the basic steps. It's a accelerated video. So you can see uh, opening the cistern. Uh, it's a right-sided cerebral, uh, cerebral pontine cistern. 
and getting into the root of the uh, trigeminal nerve, trying to get the uh, lesion from the safe entry zone, which was called a third trigeminal zone, uh, slight convolution and devascularization of this zone, and going into the lesion directly, uh, internal decompression, and end block resection uh, was the target of our operation. So uh, as mentioned before, uh, the goal of surgery is uh, resect the whole uh, cavernoma uh, without any remnants to leave in order to achieve uh, in order to achieve the best results and trying to save patients from recurrent rate. Here we are using some hemostatic agents and uh, cottonoids and waiting for a good uh, meticulous anesthesis. Continuous irrigation and checking whether it is uh, bloody or not. So, and then we finish in this uh, awareness malformations. We did a post-operative CT. So the malformation was resected completely. You can see uh, nicely removed uh, Confirmation, no remnants and uh, successful, we can say, uh, surgery. And post operative clinical status of the patients. Raising the hands. So the motor functions are well spared. So, uh, oculomotor functions. So, I have mentioned before that he has already uh, a decent nerve palsy, and that palsy was not uh, repaired. So, but the, there was no additional neurological deficits. So, uh, we can evaluate that it's a good result after operation. In conclusion, uh, we can say that brainstem cavernomas are challenging brainstem lesions. Once it bleeds, the bleeding rate is relatively high. Uh, radical resection and preserving normal brainstem anatomy is critical. Using neural navigation and uh, tractography MRI leads to preservation of eloquent areas. This is mostly in case of supratentorial lesions. Uh, and uh, surgery at subacute phase is preferable. Thank you so much for your attention, dear young colleagues. And I will be uh, very happy to uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dilschalt, for your presentation. It was really nice and uh, I enjoyed it very much. Um, if there are any questions in the audience, uh, you're free right now to ask. Uh, you can put also the questions in the chat or uh, just raise up your microphone and uh, ask a question.
Max, do, um, do you have any questions? Um, right now, not. <laughs> I'm still, my mind is full of information. It was a great presentation, thank you. Um, and interesting to see the approach to the brainstem because I did the theoretical stuff and now it's like the first time I really saw the practical stuff. So it was interesting. Yes, your uh, lecture was very interesting for me also. And uh, it was uh, interesting to me to know that uh, you guys doing so, so much very uh, comprehensive work on neurosurgery. This is a neurosurgical club, right? Yes. Yeah. Then uh, you are fourth uh, uh, great students, yeah? In a medical university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is very good. Uh, I hope you you guys will be uh, very prominent neurosurgeons uh, in near future. Yeah, after finishing your medical university, and uh, this is how uh, neurosurgeon should uh, should work on yourself on himself. And I really enjoyed this uh, kind of neurosurgical club. And uh, it is very, uh, uh, I can say it uh, in German that uh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Max already, uh, he's from Germany. Yeah. No, really? Yes. All right. Brought yeah. right. Ah, oh, freut mich sehr. Okay, wir können später vielleicht noch reden. Ja, ja, das unbedingt. All right. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated to our webinar this meeting. Um, thank you to Dr. Dilschot for making his time to us and for presenting um, his case. Also, thank you to Max who uh, make an effort to have uh, this presentation with us today. Um, we are continuing our uh, students' sessions next week with uh, the anatomy of some important vessels, middle cerebral artery, and um, uh, further on the third, uh, the first ju uh, June, we are looking also for uh, uh, having our last uh, lecture. We will announce uh, some more details on the upcoming time. Uh, but we are happy to uh, make such a great uh, work with you uh, and with all of the students coming from all around the world. Um, thank you very much. And I wish you have a great night and uh, see you very soon. All right. Thank you have so much, guys. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you.